Welcome back again. We will begin shortly with uh, Father Carboneau's presentation. I'm not sure about the rest of our planet, but here in Western Oregon, it is just incredibly beautiful. The birds are singing. It's like, um, it's like a natural orchestra outside. It's quite lovely. And um, every once in a while, you may have noticed my two cats have made uh, some appearances, which has become part, I think, of Zoom culture. Uh, Zoom culture has I, it redefined in many ways the whole uh, teaching and symposium and conference enterprise. Well, Shurjian Jodala, as we say, time has arrived. This is our final formal presentation. Tomorrow, of course, Dr. Nancy Steinhardt will be uh, presenting our keynote address. This presentation is by Father Robert Carboneau, the passionist priest, archivist, and is teaching at uh, Scranton University. And uh, the respondent today is Dr. Christy Chow. We're, we're very honored to have both of you. I will turn it over to Father Carboneau. Okay, um, let's see. Uh, um, any? Okay, I think we're all set, I believe. Is that right, Tony? We can hear you and we can see your, your PowerPoint, so we're set. Okay, thank you very much. Um, well, being able to participate in this symposium on uh, Sino-Christian architecture sponsored by the Whitworth University uh, Simpson Lecture Series is a, uh, the Vala Lecture Series is a great gift to me. I'm grateful to uh, Dr. Anthony Clark for organizing it uh, the and the committee and also for the respondent, uh, Dr. Christy Cho, uh, Chow as well. So uh, this lecture is on the long march of architecture, the enduring passion of uh, Yenon Catholic Church. It mirrors my own personal story of historical research on Christianity in China. When Dr. Uh, Anthony Clark asked me if I might want to participate, our initial discussion led to my proposal to reflect on the Yenon uh, China as a pilgrimage site. While immediately identified as a destination of Mao Zedong's long march in uh, October, 1935. Eventually the Yan'an Catholic Church became home to the Lushan Academy of Arts in 1938. So in conjunction with the theme of the symposium, I wanna emphasize the dual architectural leg legacy of the Lushan Academy. It's a historic Catholic church and also a communist heritage site. Thus it reminds, it reminds us to ask how facts are pertinent to religious and secular narratives and visual optics. How are they understood over the decades, in the present moment, and into the future? I will explore this question in four sections. Part one coincides with historic materials and published material research from the Passionist China collection. Joseph Ho, uh, Professor Joseph Ho has used that collection very well over the last couple of years. Parts two and three accentuate my trips to Yenon in 2007 and 2019. Part four stresses the importance of turning our attention to the issue of referencing and labeling this historic Yenon historical architectural edifice. I'm suggesting that it has a bifurcated identity. As we shall see, it was a Catholic church taken over by the communists after they arrived in Yenon. This was done when they realized their sense of community required an adequate social gathering space. My short conclusion addresses how this historic church architecture urges us to remember the long march of Catholicism in China. This integral point might enliven how we formulate the integrity and the educational purpose of ongoing international cross-cultural narratives that pertain to China, religion, and especially in conjunction with the Holy See. Uh, understanding the sacred parameters I've just described about came by chance. A variety of circumstances led me to realize the incredible resources available 
that were to be found in the Passionist China collection. Presently, its physical home is at the University of Scranton in special collections. Digital access also exists here, as well as at the Ricci Institute for Chinese uh, Western Cultural History, which is now in the process of being relocated to Boston College. It's uh, in, in the process right now, and scholars may make an appointment with me or Ricci Institute or the special collections at the University of Scranton to uh, somehow get access to the Passionist China collection as it becomes more available to the public. As we, cr we cross paths, all of us uh, in our lives with history in a wide variety of ways. It was 1975 for me, and you can imagine how stunned I was to be reading Barbara Tuckman's book, Stillwell, General Stillwell and the American, Ex American Experience in China, when I turned a page to learn that Father Cormac Shanahan had visited Mao Zedong in Yenin. At that time, Shanahan was a Catholic priest, a member of the Passionist congregation. And I was in the Passionist Theologate as a graduate student at St. John's University in Jamaica, Queens, New York. That summer, I happened to meet Shanahan on assignment in Jamaica, West Indies. There I had basic discussions with him about his experience. Of course, I was naive and smart enough to realize that the collected Passionist archival material on West Hunan, China that I had stumbled upon at our monastery in Union City sent me on a lifelong pilgrimage that could and still does offer me an intellectual puzzle. I am still trying to put it together, all the pieces. So my quest, like many of us drawn to this symposium, is to understand the history of the Chinese Catholic Church in the 20th century and today. Having enjoyed meeting Father Shanahan on the island of Jamaica, a couple of years later, he went to visit his relatives in Massachusetts. So I went to visit him. I was completely shocked when he opened the desk drawer and handed me an old passport. This is my diary that I kept when I visited Mao Zedong in 1944. You, he stated with kind assurance, will know what to do with this. Admittedly, every time I tell this story, I'm overcome with emotion. The moment really was that dramatic. I will have a short summary on the content of the diary a bit later. When Shanahan, Father Shanahan gave me this archival resource, China was just emerging from the Cultural Revolution of 1966 to 1976. I suggest that all of us can learn from that moment I had with Shanahan. It is of paramount value that we do our utmost to be perceived by others to be open-minded, trustworthy, certainly as people and as well as scholars. As I write this sentence in 2021, I cringe with fear as to how circumscribed ideological and theoretical paradigms might be sabotaging and in fact destroying essential avenues that keeps us on the journey that we are on a long march of historical cooperation and learning about Sino-Western relationships. We have to keep our minds open with China and China must keep our minds open with us. As soon as Shanahan arrived in West Hunan in 1926, and there you see a young Father Cormac Shanahan, uh, he began to immerse himself in the Chinese language and culture. And eventually this was his ticket after a couple different places being assigned to Chongqing during the height of the Sino uh, anti-Japanese war of 1937 to 1945. Shanahan died in 1987. By that time, having possession of his diary now for some years, I had traveled down a lot of one-way streets in my quest to understand its content and context. The code was broken when I was at a workshop on archives at Catholic University and Father James Flint, an American Benedictine historian, knew that the China correspondent was accessible at the Library of Congress in Washington, DC. As an editor of that short-lived publication, Shanahan took full advantage of his guanxi 
in Chongqing to find himself a member of the 1944 Yan'an Press Party, where he also represented the China correspondent. It's interesting to note that that China correspondent was given of a, as a gift by Henry Wallace, um, who was uh, at that time vice president, I believe, of the United States. That's who gave this, uh, and it was a, a journal that was made to boost the morale of uh, troops in uh, American troops, and it was produced in Bangkok, written in Chongqing, and then sent out by U.S. Uh, a troop uh, planes to American service uh, men and uh, probably women too, all across uh, China that, that they had access to. But Shanahan was a member, was a reporter for the China Correspondent, and also a reporter for Catholic news publications. That's how he ended up on a member of the Yan'an Party to visit Mao in 1944. Unreservedly, Shanahan used this latter credential as a member of the press party and the Catholic press to ascertain the conditions by which Catholics were living in Yan'an since Mao Zedong's arrival there in 1935 at the end of the Long March and instituted what Mark Selden wrote about as the Yan'an Way. In the process, this communist movement impinged upon Bishop Ibanez, who had just completed building the Yan'an Cathedral. Ibanez and the legacy of Yan'an Catholics to the present merit greater scholarly attention. In 1945, Shanahan wrote an article for Sign Magazine. It, he says that he writes of the Catholic mass that he said at the Yanan Church. He offers greater detail on this as well in his diary. My published research from the Verbeest Institute in, 19, in 2007, based on the magazine, the diary, and other sources, did not allow me to find any printed material in the Chinese press um, in, in the, about the summer of 1944 mass that Shanahan described uh, in the Sign Magazine article. And I, I looked to a couple of Chinese libraries uh, trying to find uh, this information. Subsequently, as Shanahan mentions himself, I have learned uh, through another scholar that the public notice of the Catholic mass might have been printed only for the local Yan'an population and not for the wider network that the Communist Party was trying to reach and convert to their ideological and military cause. As seen in this image, you can see uh, inset here, uh, some of the photos. Uh, there's an etching there of the church, uh, the Shanahan going into the entry of the church. There's also another photo there that shows Shanahan uh, saying mass in the church. And then there's a large group photo here that uh, I took as well. Um, so this is uh, the photo that was done in Sign Magazine. You see Mao Zedong in the blue, you see Shanahan in the red, Zhou Enlai actually in the yellow. And this familiar uh, party was published also uh, as, as part of Sign Magazine. And uh, unfortunately, the China collection does not have the original of that. That was only published in the magazine. But this is a very familiar photo that is usually shown up in many situations. And this was done by the journalist at, um, uh, um, Israel Epstein. And here you see Shanahan. Uh, you also see uh, Mao Zedong there and uh, all the members of the press party that were there uh, at that time. When I was a professor in uh, Sichuan uh, International Studies University in Chongqing from 2007 to 2008, I did my best to identify with the hilly terrain, climate, and social pouts that Father Shanahan and the entire population had faced as they survived the Japanese bombing from, uh, from the 1940s. However, as soon as I became settled, and it was probably about two months after I started teaching there, there was um, a weekend, it was probably around the anniversary there, the founding of the Communist Party in October, I became settled and my knowledge of the Shanahan provided me with the impetus to make my own pilgrimage to Yan'an in 2007. Whereas the 1986 and 1989 editions of the Father Jean Charbonnet Guide to the Catholic Church in China reference a Catholic presence in Yan'an, the 1997 
the 2000, the 2004, the 2008, and this page from the 2014 edition were published with actual directions on how to get to the Yan'an church in the part of the city known as Xiao or Go. In doing so, it confirmed an acceptable historical truth. The architectural structure represented missionaries and the Chinese Catholics, as well as the Lushan Academy, which the guidebook stated was in the process of renovation. So in 2007, I traveled by air from Chongqing to Xi'an. Only one plane arrives there every day at that time. That got me from Xi'an to Yan'an. With the guidebook in hand, I boarded a local bus. Suspecting I was on an incorrect bus, locals put me on another bus. Thereupon showing the guidebook again, someone yelled at the bus driver. He slammed on the brakes. Someone literally threw me off the, book, off the bus, pointed in the right direction, and in the smog of the horizon, I took this photo of the historic Yenin church in Xiao Ergo. And you can just see the um, images there in the smog of the church. And so what I had to do was I had to start a walk across a couple fields and eventually the edifice soon became much clearer. Very conscious of the spirit of Father Cormac Shanahan, I had my photo taken at that church. Although weather beaten, the following three markers caught my attention. They identified the history of the site known as the Army School of Arts from 1941 to 43. It was under the management of the Province Relics Commission. There's also some uh, translations done by uh, Teresa Altaldo. I'm thankful for her for doing this. And there's a mention in one of the Catholic Church in relationship to the synopsis of the Lushan Academy. It reminds the, the viewer of the importance of the Lushan Academy that it did emerge, in fact, from a Catholic church. And then there's another image as the translation goes on, and it reminds the viewer that people who are associated with the site are Mao Zedong, Zhou Enlai, and Hulong, the communist uh, military leader. S seen here as well is a statement that the communist government renovation had been underway from 1988 to 1990. It was probably done in order to celebrate another 10 year anniversary of the founding of the People's Republic of China. Taking full advantage of the moment, I surprised several workmen and I finagled myself to get inside the church where I took these photos of the interior construction that was underway. This was a very haunting experience for me to see the exterior of this church. I never thought I would find this church where uh, Shanahan said this mass. I knew he had done this, but even to find the church, then to even find that I could get inside it, and then even to find once again that they were doing renovation and reconstruction. And I started warming around here, taking photographs of this church. Uh, so I've selected a couple other photos. Here you see it being underway, and they were serious about this. And I'm thinking this is gonna take a long time to figure out given the way that sometimes things work in China. And also you see the outside of the church uh, which was going on at the time. And I wanted to show you these two images because after that, the area left me very tired. I was very reflective. And I spent a good part of the afternoon pondering really in this location that this is a sacred location, a former Catholic church and a communist party historic site. Then I regained my stamina. And over the next days, I walked around as a tourist. Coming across some locals in the city square, I couldn't help but wonder as they played instruments and sort of were enjoying their day, how they had survived the past decades in this communist stronghold in historic area in Yenin. I also took notice of the skyline in 2007. It had reemerged from mountain caves to high rising buildings that probably uh, are just unbelievable when you stop and think of what was going on in those caves of, of, the, of the famous areas of Yenin. Then by maintaining my own openness to scholarship and established networks in China, 
I was invited once again to visit Yan'an in 2019. Communist Party officials offered me an invitation to attend this conference as a keynote speaker. I was asked to share my historic interpretation of the 1944 press party with scholars who had been researching that event and this whole importance of Yan'an in journalism. That was what the issue was about. As you might expect, the official, uh, the obligatory official guided tour sponsored by the party had us on an air conditioned bus that took us 15 minutes on a ride from a first class hotel to the Lushan Academy site where I again took my photo. So where I had been wandering on buses that seemed far outside the city, in reality, the city has grown up and it's only now about a 15 minute ride from the downtown area on a much more advanced highways and roads. I want to express the historical theme that I emphasized at this conference was that the Catholic missionaries like Father Shanahan would have had a great deal of interaction with the civic and political actors of his generation. He first saw how they went back and forth, the communists, during the birthing of the Communist Party in 1920, to make the, the, in the 1920s. To make that point, I showed the conference attendees this photo of communist leader Ho Long. In 1924, he was with the Passionist missionaries in their mission to celebrate the wedding of a relative who was married as a, a Chinese Catholic. At that time, Ho Long was very much a local bandit. Now with candid sensitivity, I didn't mention Ho Long as Tufe, as bandit, but I made the point that Shanahan knew how to save face in a Chinese world. Those who were present at the 2019 Yenin conference were extremely surprised to see this and other photos from the Passionist China collection. Indeed, such content challenged their historic communist narrative. They had to grapple with the fact that missionary sources are valuable and that such sources blend the religious narrative and the rise and power of communism in a variety of unexpected ways. Again, the Yanan Catholic Church is an example. As I detail in my 2007 article, it is no wonder that Shanahan arrived in Yanan in 1944 with a resolve to observe and question communist leaders on social, political, and religious conditions there. Shanahan asserted his right to say a Catholic mass and bring the Catholic sacraments to the local Chinese people. They had been increasingly marginalized under the Yanan communists. On July 2nd, 1944, over 500 people attended the mass in the former Yanan cathedral that had been converted into the Lushan Academy. Catholics, as well as a choir of communist students were present and sang hymns. 60 received communion. As seen in this reference in Foreign Relations of the United States on July 22nd, 1944, Shanahan, the passionist priest and journalist, provided the Xi'an consulate officer from the United States, Edward E. Rice, with a forthright assessment on the pros and cons of Yan'an life that had he had been able to witness. In the end, the Shanahan trip and Shanahan did come away with a religious and political overview. As I have argued, he was a good priest and a good journalist. His observation as a reporter remain invaluable today. His diary and debriefing offer a new cache of political, military, social history and detail that's waiting to be studied. For example, it is worth noting that Zhou Enlai suggested the possibility that Shanahan consider being assigned to Yenin as a chaplain. Respected gestures and invitations are often abundant during personal encounters at, when, we, when the communists, especially at that time, were seeking to try to get domestic and international credibility. So it's no wonder that they offered him an opportunity. Uh, Shanahan uh, said that he wanted the invitation in writing, but Zoen Lai said, that's up to Mao, that's up to other people, I cannot give that to you. So I suggest that scholars and international visitors to Yenin, as well as the Chinese themselves, must renegotiate and express facts accurately. Foreign relations in the United States is a public domain online. 
Shanahan's debriefing upon leaving Xi'an offers a narrative to understand how the Communist Party was struggling to make Yan'an the enterprise and work at a crucial time of the anti-Japanese war. In part, that was why the Yan'an Press Party of 1944 and the subsequent Dixie mission months later arrived at Yan'an to truthfully understand the reality of the situation. Some of the debriefing themes which uh, Rice, uh, which Shanahan told Rice are still rich to explore. And I've added this uh, just because I thought it was a little bit more important just to add this is in, the, my, in my first preview of the, of the uh, PowerPoint that I put together. This is what sh the discussion points that Shanahan and Rice, the diplomat or the consular official had on, on Yenin. Shanahan offered his opinion on communist controls exerted over the people. Chinese communist ideology, policies, and program, status of religion, foreigners in the Yenin area, the Yenin uh, airfield, the radio stations, the communist achievements, communists of failures, and the Guomindang communist relations. Shanahan had a broad mind here, and that's very important for all of us to keep a broad mind about what is always going on. At this moment, though, I want to turn quickly and turn my attention to how the different the Chiao Ergo look in my 2019 visit as compared to 2007. First, these two images now guide a tourist along the paved entrance into the historic site. The weather-worn historic markers that I took photos of in 2007 are now removed. No doubt, to celebrate the 70th anniversary of the PRC, the courtyard has multiple pieces of art, and this is only a selection of them, that show Chinese communists Mao and Lu Shun, but also the ideological legacy of Marx and Lenin. Travel and experience in China for me, and I think for all of us who have been to China, has reminded us to always be conditioned to expect the unexpected. This proved to be true when I saw that even at this point in time, there was a, P, a pipe organ music concert. Totally was unex, it was totally unexpected that I was hearing the performer practicing classical music as she faced the images of Russian revolutionaries in what was once the sanctuary of the Catholic Church where the 1944 mass was said and prayed in what I suspect was really the last Catholic mass ever to be said in the Yanin Catholic Church. In my mind, the whole incident that I walked into ran counter to the overriding Confucian authority of China that has beset China in 2019 and has been utilized by the government. Seeking to capture the full meaning of what was before me, I took a photo of the practice session whereupon I was immediately and publicly rec reprimanded for disturbing the peace. Instead of woodworking maze, that I had encountered in 2007, the interior now, as you can see, has been totally transformed. It's now a crossroads, a cultural crossroads. It's clean and ready to receive visitors. And here's another image here that you can see from a distance on how really well uh, preserved in that renovation from the time I was there in 2007. Admittedly, I had a prayerful moment. I was very sensitive that the devotional alcoves that you saw on the side of the church where a Catholic priest might have said a private mass or a Catholic uh, might have written uh, lit candles for believers uh, to pray for someone, instead of being sacred space that had been present in the 1930s when the church was constructed, present viewers in, nine, in 2019 could now walk up to painted artwork and notice they're actually painting pictures of the church once again. In fact, this is a former church in a series of buildings behind the structure that was exhibit space that accentuated artistic images to advance the historic and understanding of contemporary Catholicism. However, basic online research keeps bringing the Yenin Cathedral into the overall historic narrative of the Communist Party at a seminal point in its history. Continual recognition of the Yannan Cathedral accentuates my purpose and my framework, that there's a dual historical identity to the site. It remains, I guess, what I would call sacred, 
that signals an intersect of Catholic as well as communist past. This is evident by mulling over how this architectural site has remained the same. It has also transformed since the 1930s when it was first built by Spanish missionaries and Chinese Catholics. A Catholic or a communist believer, and some Chinese are both, can feel very appropriate a spirit that maybe challenges and reassures their belief at the Chiao or Go site. So I suggest that it is a sacred place. For instance, this is a captivating uh, image to conjure up the image of famed journalist Agnes Spedley as a dance instructor in 1937 within, within the Chiao or Go church with Mao Zedong, Zhu De, Zhou Enlai, and Ho Long in attendance. While we typically confine Catholic religious worship to incense and devotional singing, is in this instance, this is sacred space. It was a perfect site for Smedley in her capacity as what I would call a foreign insider to sanction another communal activity, dance. While many might be aware of the historic impact the Canadian doctor Norman Bethune had in Yenin from January 1938 till his unfortunate death in November 1939, recent research has made known to me that his translator was a Canadian nurse named Jean Ewan that she served with the Franciscan missionaries in Wuchang Hubei in the 1930s makes me wonder if personal devotion might have led her to pause and say a prayer when she visited the Vienna Catholic Church as it was coming to life as Lushan Academy. This is especially true if she was informed that this church was a Franciscan church under the leadership of Bishop Ibanez, Ibanez from Spain. It's also worth noting that um, Jean Ewan's uh, ashes are buried in Shurjia Zong. This source by Eddie Yu provides an example of how the Catholic Church is a narrative tool. However, while this is an accurate contribution, a new generation of historians might ask, what is the living legacy of the Chinese Catholic community? In 2021, the Lushan Academy is promoted as one of the top 10 tourist sites in Yenin. And here's the English version of that website. While it offers a passing note to this holy site of the Chinese communist past, it was a Catholic church. What are the possible options that might exist for party officials who coordinate the historic site to provide more information on the church architecture? Preparing for this lecture, for example, makes me wonder who the architect really was. The next image harkens back to my personal journey in 2007. At the time, I was unaware that in 2007, the uh, China Daily stressed the religious legacy of the Yan'an Church in relationship to Lushan Academy. I suggest the article provided what I would describe a harmonious religious relationship that invited public participation for local Catholics, Protestants, and Muslims in Yan'an. Highlighted graphics in this image before you specify the respect of the Communist Party towards religious freedom. Edward Berman, a, a documentary filmmaker who founded EB Cultural Enterprises with an office in Hong Kong in 2015, published a photo of the Yenin Catholic Church. The a company caption tells us that the Sixth Party Congress plenary session was held at the Catholic Church, which was then the largest building in the city. This is an important and relevant statement for historians who study Sino-Christian architecture. Within the time frame of the 20th century, Bandits, warlords, nationalists, communists, mi Japanese military and officials often occupied churches or religious structure. It was simply the norm. Often these religious sites were just the most secure building in the area. This Chiao or Go church in Yan'an is a symbolic of how religious believers were caught in the systematic chaos of change that consumed 20th century China. Within the Long March project is a resource called Artworks Recognized in Yan'an. It is a series of visual archival references, which reveals the ongoing trajectory of how the reincarnation of the Lushan Academy is a reverenced architectural space. As best as I can determine, in 2006, exhibitions included Her Jen Wei, Perlio, Yena woodcutting prints in a performance, the Long March Project documentary in 2006, and Lu Jia did something called No Foreigners Beyond This Point, and Dan Mills from the United States did miss understanding the Long March prints. In 1975, 
uh, Thomas Berry wrote in Cross Currents an article entitled, entitled Mao Zedong, The Long March. In part, he described it as follows. Nothing makes sense apart from the story and the particular shape it takes. Not to know the story of the long march is to know nothing. To know the story is to know everything. The comprehensive story, the primary myth, the ultimate context of the communist Chinese affairs is the account of the long march, the Chinese version of that ancient archetypal symbol of the journey. Father Berry was assigned to China in 1948. It was back within a year due to the communists gained control in 49. Father Shanahan, as mentioned earlier, went to China in 1926. Given that both insights and both passionists had about the long march in Yan'an, it's unfortunate that I never got the two men together to discuss the topic. Furthermore, I suggest their experience and mind remind us how religion enters into the long march of Chinese history, specifically in this instance by architecture. Tourists would be well served to promote uh, Yan'an cultural heritage as a sacred space in the Roman Catholic tradition. It was recognized as reverential ongoing legacy and a foundational cornerstone and an actual inspiration for the Communist Party. Acknowledgement on the site would be proof of a respectful way that the accords between the Holy See and the PRC might actually possess depth from the past to the present. Without trying to force that image, it might be worthwhile to consider Lushan Academy as a mutual acceptable uh, symbol as uh, to relation of, of the Holy See and the Catholic Church presence. This has been done in other locations. International and Chinese tourists coordinate with the Yan'an Church, maybe in the same way when they visit the Nestorian Stele in Xi'an that dates back to the eighth century Tang Dynasty. A potential educational opportunity is most realized at the tomb of Matteo Ricci, which is located at the Political Education University in Beijing. International scholars have studied the graves. Numerous websites and published sources attest to how this gravesite sanctions Christian Chinese reality. It is just a fact of history. Yet visits there in recent years have led me to understand that Chinese tourist guide, and you see on, on my right, I guess, the, they assign and attribute the friendship of Ricci as expressed in the, how the Chinese acknowledge it. But I specifically asked in 2019, I asked the tour guide, if Matteo Ricci is an essential friend of China and was a Christian, might it be appropriate gesture that the architecture of this grave serve as an invitation for more inquisitive tourists to make their own visits to the famed South Church in Beijing that is associated with Ricci. Other Catholic and Christian sites throughout the city of Beijing remind the public of the value of religion and culture. Appropriating the spirit and norms of international tourism, I propose that it is worthwhile being aware how the architectural heritage identifies the long march of religion in China. In this presentation, I have suggested that this holds true at Yan'an. There is a Chiao Ergo church that is equally serves as a symbol to the longstanding memory of the Catholic and communist narratives. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, let's just immediately turn the virtual podium over to Professor Christy Chow, who will provide uh, her response. Unf you're muted, Professor Chow. Yep, okay, I'm so sorry. Thank you for including me in this conversation and thanks uh, Anthony Clark uh, for uh, organizing this uh, wonderful uh, presentation. I learned so much from all the presentations and I'm happy to have a conversation with uh, Dr. Carbonell. Um, when I first studied Dr. Carbonell's presentation materials, one script, uh, scriptural text uh, ran in my mind. In the book of Daniel and in the Gospel of Matthew of the Protestant Bible, there is uh, one expression that says, quote, the abomination of desolation standing in the holy place. Some biblical scholars render this text as explaining a pagan invasion into a holy site. And then 
I kept pondering when I studied uh, Dr. Carbono's um, um, materials. And I asked myself, from a theological perspective, if what is happening to the Yan'an Cathedral today is not some sort of, quote, abomination of desolation of a sacred architecture, then how do we understand the story of the, of the cathedral? But then I thought a Chinese patriot may view the case very differently. He or she may be happy to see the sinicized outlook of the cathedral, and in particular, the version where all the statues of the nation's heroes standing outside the church building's main entrance, as shown in some of the slides um, Dr. Carbono has just um, showed us. Indeed, today the church architecture symbolizes the deep foundation of the Chinese Communist Party and its victorious revolutionary project on Chinese soil, putting an end to the nation's shameful semi-colonial past. By now, we learned from Dr. Carbino that both Christian and Chinese nationalistic perspectives to see this Catholic church architecture are very one-sided, insufficient for a fuller comprehension of the meaning of the cathedral in the long history of Sino-Western relationship. Dr. Carbino challenges us to be open-minded about the complicated story behind the Yan'an Cathedral what we have just heard from him is not only his pilgrimage to the cathedral, an emotional and personal journey of unlocking the lost history of a Catholic architecture, something that the Chinese communist narrative has tried to suppress. The hidden story he uncovered is a result of many years of archival research, careful field observations, and very importantly, faith-based reflection. All these methodologies help to yield a nuanced interpretation of a Catholic architecture. Led by Mao Zedong, the Chinese Communist Party arrived in Yan'an in Shanxi province in late 1935, ending the long march from Southeast Asia, uh, sorry, Southeast China. They made Yan'an their base for the next 12 years. Here, a Catholic infrastructure gave a ready-made shelter for the party leaders. The cave dwellings protected the leaders from West China's harsh weather. These caves were previously converted by earlier missionaries into a mission clinic, a church school, and a missionary residence. In this well-built Catholic compound, the communists experimented many practices and ideas, which would later form the foundation of New China. Major instances include the agricultural cooperatives, strategies of fighting guerrilla warfare against the Guomindang, the Maoist philosophy of, quote, new democracy, and the model for conducting political work among the masses. Notably, the first ratification campaign that helped Mao Zedong purging his enemies inside the party happened right here in this Catholic co complex. And also, uh, as uh, Dr. Carbono just mentioned, the party founded the Yan'an Lushin Academy of Art in 1938. It was the very first institution for nurturing the communist literary development. So it is no wonder that the, the, the Yan'an Cathedral was put under central government's protection and was listed as a Guobao, a national treasury in 1961, among many historic relics. This status possibly guarded the church from attack during the Cultural Revolution. One needs not look further than the, another cathedral, uh, which is the uh, Gan Gu Yi uh, Cathedral, for a comparison. This cathedral is, was located and is still located 40 kilometers away from East Yan'an, it is a Gothic style cathedral and it was built around the same time with the Yan'an Cathedral in the 1930s. The Gangu Yi Cathedral suffered in all the political upheavals from the 1950s onward. During the Cultural Revolution, the Red Gods battered the church's interior and the church was later turned into a granary and like the Yan'an Cathedral, 
was never returned to the local Catholics. And only recently in 2014, did the Gangu Yi Church complex win the political favor from the local authorities in the rise of patriotic tourism. In Dr. Carbonell's telling, although the story of the Yan'an Cathedral is tied inextricably with the Chinese Communist Party narrative, the church architecture still standing intact today visually reminds people of the entry of Catholicism into the local Chinese society. And this story symbolizes what Dr. Carbonell calls a long march of resilient Catholics embodies complicated engagements between foreign missionaries and local Chinese, and it entails twists and turns, most of the time unexpected by the people involved. I think in my own reckoning, his long march view is a reminder of a deep historical approach. It works like a binocular. It has two lenses, one for each eye to view distant objects more clearly. And so, the Yan'an church architecture offers a binocular vision with one lens for explaining the historical legacy of Catholicism, another for considering the Chinese cultural heritage embodied in the church's present Sinicized form. Both visions need each other to enrich the meaning of the cathedral. The stones and concrete of the cathedral withstands the decade-long manipulations imposed upon it, shifting its purpose to secular contour. But the story of Father uh, Shanahan tells us that faith-based endurance would pop up to witness and give testimony, even in politicized settings. And the passionate sources suggest just that, as we now know that Shanahan over the last mass inside the Yan'an Cathedral to both the Catholics and the communists. On the other hand, Dr. Carbonell's field observations illuminate the multiple meanings the cathedral is capable of, and it makes us reflect on the degree of fluid, fluidity a church, architect, a church architecture can push for. For instance, as Father Carbonell has shown us, over the past years, the local authorities have employed a pragmatic approach to present the church to the public for local and international tourism. Popular tourist guides promote the church site as the house of the Lushin Art Academy, not a place of Christian worship. Because the site was repurposed to propagate the Chinese communist sentiment, the site loses its original religious meaning. Despite this political sanitization process, the government does not efface the church's basic ornamentation. At least this is the case in the exterior. And so the Romanist facade and nave are still there. And these features attract Catholics or those who appreciate religious tourism to come to visit the church. And to these visitors, Catholic inspiration remains a basic aura of the church. I think on the surface, preserving the old church buildings seems to run against the present anti-Christian sentiment that is widespread in the countless instances of cross demolition uh, since 2014. Within the promotion of the sanitization of Christianity, many church communities are required to show patri patriotism by flying the national flag or singing the national anthem on the pulpit. In some sense, it is perhaps because the Yan'an Cathedral is able to mean different things to different recipients, whether one can view it as an ideological heritage, a national pride, or a religious icon, that it is outside the recent sanitization har uh, harassments. And so at this point, I would like to offer three questions for uh, Dr. Carbonell uh, for our continued conversation. My first question relates to the local Yan'an Catholics. In your visits to Yan'an, did you have a chance to talk to the local Catholics? And what do we know about their life? How do, we, how do they see what the government has been doing to the Yan'an Cathedral, um, um, the, all those manip manipulations? That is the first question. My second question concerns uh, Father uh, Shanahan. Is there any information in his diary about his personal feeling 
toward the communist takeover of the church site. Besides the mosque in 1944, did he, gave, did he have any interaction with the local Catholics at the time when he was um, working for the party in Yan'an? My last question is a methodological one. You propose that uh, we should view the Catholic uh, cathedral um, uh, having a, a, a dual identity. Um, it is a sacred site for both the communists and the Catholics. I think this reconceptualization requires we relativize the religious meaning of the Catholic architecture. Um, and we have to shift our um, perspective to, uh, to see that, to consider that communist ideology to be as sacred as the gospel. But I think it poses a challenge to Christian religions that base the faith, faith conviction on absolute claims. So given today's physical reality of the cathedral that its original religious function is completely absent. And although the form is still there, how far can we still hold the cathedral as a sacred Christian space? Or is it just a decorative or cosmetic uh, architecture uh, to borrow some terminologies that I learned from uh, Dr. David Wang uh, this morning? Or as Dr. Joseph Ho's presentation told us moments ago that Chinese Christian architect architecture is anchor by buildings, but also beyond buildings? Is it not just about physical materials, but also about belonging, embodiment, people, community of Christians? Do we envision the Yan'an Cathedral as sacred without religious community? And, and lastly, um, echoing uh, what um, Dr. Amy O'Keefe O'Ke has just inspired us to think in light of using photography as an invitation how might the cathedral invite us to think beyond its concrete and stones and help us to re-envision re something new? Um, I think I will just stop here. Um, thank you. Professor Chow, thank you so much for those rich three plus questions. The third question I think had uh, uh, some 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 additional questions, um, Father Rob will Father Carbono will have you answer in just a moment those three questions first, and then we have I, I'm counting at least six other questions, some in the chat uh, open. I, I want to just say briefly uh, that in my own research in and around both Shanxi and Shanxi, both of the Shanxi provinces, the the character Go Gully like Chowar Go was um, a sign that that's a Christian village. And it's just interesting to me, I, so I, wanna, I wonder then, you know, whenever you're in those two provinces and you see something, something go, um, it's a hint that it's a Christian area. I wonder if the, the party members on the Long March would have known that tradition in that area, um, perhaps not. Uh, but let's just open it up for you to uh, first respond to uh, Professor Chow and then, then I'll ask you some questions that have been sent to me. Well, I, I'm very happy to have uh, the comments from Professor Chow. Um, I'm especially happy because I know she's done extensive field work in her own area in um, the southern uh, province. I believe it's in Guan, Guan, Guanzo, Guan, Guangdong province. And um, so I'm uh, well aware that you know, your, your questions come from your own personal experience. Um, did I meet any uh, Catholics in these two trips? In 2007, I did not. Uh, I was just lucky enough to find the church. I thought I was, uh, that was, uh, and just see what was going on. I wasn't so much always concerned about the church, uh, but I wanted to sort of get the feel for the area because I, I had written about the diary and I wanted to try to get a sense. In the 2019 trip, however, at the conference, a woman came up to me and she said that she was a Catholic. She says, uh, I know about this church. I'm one of the local uh, Catholics here. And if you ever come back here, come visit the church because there is an existent Catholic church uh, in, and it's in the guidebook of uh, Father Charbonnier uh, where you can go visit and probably attend the mass. I, I have not had that opportunity. I'd like to go back there again and see that. But there is a Catholic community that's vibrant there. Um, what did Shanahan in your second question? No, the diary actually, and it's it's the diary is pretty tough to go through. It's a lot of minutia. It's a 
40 pages of handwritten script. It's very clear, uh, very good writing. But uh, in the article I wrote in 2007 out of Leuven, I have detailed footnotes on um, who are the names of the people that Shanahan actually baptized. So there, he was actually doing sacramental work there. And uh, that was, I think he had very strong opinions and that was true uh, for a lot of the missionaries at that time, especially as they were in a very important flux of time about moving around and trying to understand what was going on. And it was a very much a norm that because all these priests uh, who had been, had pretty much evacuated the area, they had moved on at the Xi'an area, uh, the communists had pretty much moved them out, that Shanahan and the local Catholics were very, they, they wanted to have the sacraments. So Shanahan did actually do that. And he was pretty strong with the officials that he wanted to go to the church and have that mass. So this was an active spatial relationship of public worship that is in his diary, but he doesn't, he does a little bit more on it in the Sign Magazine article, but he doesn't dwell on it. You know, he's, he's, he has a wide vision of what he's there to do as, as, a, as, a, um, as a person. He's not caught in the, in the sacramental world. He sees himself as, as really a witness to what's going on and his presence, I think, is that much profound. And he's in the middle of it in Chongqing uh, at this time. To the last point on the bifurcated identity, I think that's a great question, uh, Dr. Chow. I, I, um, it made me stop and think, you know, am I trying to force something here by calling it sacred? And I, you know, I think a couple things strike me. In our monastery in Union City, New Jersey, uh, which you can see from the New Jersey Turnpike or Exit 17, it's actually uh, was built. It has huge, huge uh, three towers there. Um, and as you get into the Lincoln Tunnel, you can still see the towers of St. Michael's Monastery Church. Now, when I was living there, when the archives were there, in the hot days of the summer, I would be watching people walk by the church and they would stop and they, even though the church was a Korean Presbyterian church, and now it's pretty much a shell of a church waiting for some kind of new identification, uh, the Korean Presbyterians have left there, people would stop and make a sign of the cross in front of the church. And the church was not a Catholic church anymore. So it was not operating in that capacity. Um, I go by a lot of empty churches, like we all do in North America, and probably other parts of the world, in Europe, and other aspects. But I wonder how often in stories of families where people might say, this is the church, and you know, it's certainly probably true with the Jewish community, with uh, areas that were in the Holocaust and other areas of sacred symbols of places really where people have um, know that their family or their area, even though the governance and the civil authorities, or even in some places, these situations have been transformed into restaurants, uh, you know, banks, all these other areas. Yes, they've lost the sacramental aspects. By the way, you should be a canon lawyer, a church lawyer, by asking a question about the functionality of sacramental life and, and that sort of thing. That's what canon lawyers are good at and asking about. So I commend you for the understanding that the religious services have to be taking place. But there's a wider cultural, I think, think sense that at least I'd like to sort of deal with, and I was personally dealing with about the sacred sense of that, that space. And I think anyone who sees a church uh, might ask of that. And I think it goes to my last two points in my response to you is, uh, I, I purposely looked at the last segment of, of these people like Agnes Medley, and I looked at these other reporters with, who were with Shanahan. They don't ask a lot of religious questions. Why don't people ask religious questions? I, I really think, you know, they all wanna understand the power relationships, but the lack of the religious relationship and religious narrative is part of that power relationship and that civil relationship and that human relationship. So I think sometimes reporters need to ask and, and observers have to ask very sensitive, honest religious questions to dialogue, not to be a forceful and fight back. That would be one thing I would say uh, is, is really important. So I think, uh, I would end there and open it up for further discussion, but I appreciate the comments that were um, offered and uh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Chow. Thank you, Dr. Carboneau. Um, 
we've been convened now for eight hours, more than eight hours. And I think scholars, we're a mark of endurance. It feels like we're just warming up. There's still quite a few questions. Uh, I'm going to reserve one question that is directed toward Professor Steinhardt and Professor Carboneau uh, to the very end. And that will serve as our final question before we segue into tomorrow's keynote address. Um, let's begin with uh, Dr. Wang's question. Of course, I'll just read it as it is. Of course, the Yan'an area has many cave dwellings where many local rural people still live. Can you comment on any impression you had or have on the disparity between this local cultural building form and the Western looking church present there? So what message is it sending to the local citizens, citizenry over the years of its presence? Well, the, well, I think, I think one of the things that when I was there in 2007, there's a huge pagoda in uh, the Yenan that you can see from all over the uh, horizon of the town and it rises up and I walked up to that pagoda and I took some great photos of, of local people who are still living in those um, areas. And this was in 2007. I'm not sure whether or not those, uh, those caves are or those homes are, are being lived in, but I, I have noticed actually in going through the trains and uh, across um, from Beijing to Xi'an that those, those they're, they're being utilized in maybe not homes anymore, but they're certainly uh, utilized in other ways, maybe as agrarian situations and uh, other locations for farming, whatever's left of farming. Certainly in Chongqing, the bombed out caves of Chongqing, when I lived there, they were transformed into welding areas. They were really utilized in a very certain, certain sense of space. But in terms of Yan'an in particular, uh, uh, Dr. Wong, I would say that um, I don't think necessarily that You accidentally muted yourself. Yeah. Okay. Um, I couldn't. Uh, I couldn't see where there was any dichotomy. I didn't have enough of the area. On the second part, I was with the official tour group from the government, so um, I think I was confined to theirs. I would love to explore that area and maybe learn more about the local Catholic Church, but I didn't see um, a lot of activity in the in the caves in in 2019. I actually really like these these caves in that yeah. area. I think they're very fascinating. Uh, this next question is from Professor Ho. Uh, do you have a sense of what happened to the church building and the surrounding structures during the Cultural Revolution? Was it left as is, as a political gathering space, or did the structure undergo some kind of decline followed by a post-Mao rehabilitation? Well, I, I, that's a great question, uh, Dr. Ho. Um, I was really shocked when I went there in 2007 to find out how well that uh, church was in that shape and the fact that they had been dealing with it. It, there were, <clears throat> I imagine that maybe some of the, some pews or something were taken out, but the edifice was in very, very good shape. That did not seem to be something that was under construction. I saw no activity as a outside, um, um, you know, uh, areas where there was scaffolding up there, uh, contrary to the Catholic Church in Yuan Ling, where, where I was there in 1989, and that was actually a clinic where they were actually taking and extracting people's teeth by using a handheld pedal where you would actually, uh, someone was, a dentist was pedaling and extracting, it looked probably without Novocaine, but that had been performed into a into a area space, and now that church is actually destroyed because they rebuilt the town in the city. But there's a small Catholic church, so I think that that because it was a historic site, and probably they also built a massive train station during the Cultural Revolution in uh, Yan'an, which I visited because I took the train back uh, from Xi'an to uh, from Yan'an to Xi'an, and this was a massive train station that brought pilgrims there. So during the Cultural Revolution, this was a destination for Red Guards and young people. So I doubt if they did <coughs> any destruction of that church edifice at all. I think it was probably just maintained as a cultural site where they probably had rallies and slogans. But that would be a very interesting to see if there was anything 
in the literature. Um, Professor Wong, I'm, I'm thinking rather than me reading, I should have had done this with uh, the, the other Wong and, and uh, Professor Ho. I'll just have you ask your own question. I mean, what a silly thing for me to read the question when the author of the question is, is, is in front of me. So I'll, I'll allow, uh, you'll, you can ask your question yourself, Professor Wong. Uh, sure. The, uh, oh, oh. Which, which professor? <laughs> Stephanie Wong. Stephanie, you go. I wanted to ask how more indigenous looking churches fared in, in communist strongholds. So we talked earlier about um, how originally some originally Chinese buildings got refurbished to become churches in some parts of China or in the case of Sino-Christian style churches. How, how was the dual memory that you're talking about? How did that work in their cases? It seems to me like the Yan'an cathedrals very clearly kind of foreign or Spanish character does make it hard to forget the Catholic history and narrative, um, even if especially big buildings like this were targeted for communist army and government use. So in comparison, how does how did the caves or Sino Christian church type churches? Um, how did how has their memory worked? Well, where I've been in various parts of uh, China and seen different churches and like the Sijiao Zong area. Guiyang, I was there once, uh, certainly in the urban areas. A lot of these uh, areas, the Catholics there have been pretty strong with the um, Patriotic Association to get money to refurbish it. And uh, I think part of the opening of these churches in, in, in the post Dong area, there was money available, but they also had to go through the norms of these, uh, of these rudiments of following the party and following the, the idea. But a lot of these places were actually reinvented or refurbished and, and um, some of the destruction was repaired. At the same time, as some of these Catholic areas, which are strongly Catholic in some of these towns were, uh, were, were changed, it also was an opportunity for the local Catholic churches, and this was true in Hunan, uh, in Zhejiang, in, uh, where the Flying Tigers operated out of, in uh, south of uh, Yuan Ling when I went there, they actually parlayed their relationship to actually make renovations and actually expand the churches. So in some ways, they wanted to be, as we were seeing in some of these uh, re reflections here, they actually wanted to like make it larger for a larger community. So the early churches of the 20th century, 1920s and 1930s, needed more space. And they were trying to deal with social space uh, maybe open a clinic. Uh, they were trying to serve the people, not just serve the sacraments. So there was a there, depending on where you were and and where your relationships were between the local Catholics who were willing to be with the party alliance, as opposed to those who were unregistered, which was a dichotomy because they would use the same church at the same time, and that was at times very interesting to watch. Um, there, it, it depends really on the local circumstance where it's where it's all emerging. But there's a lot of activity of, of renegotiating church space with, with political space, party narrative, and, um, and religious uh, freedom or religious uh, opportunity for uh, at least Catholic and I'm sure in the Protestant world as well. In, in uh, rural China, we would say Xiao Wang and Da Wang. Um, Professor David Wang being Da Wang and Professor Stephanie Wang being Xiao Wang. Professor David Wong, did you have, I, I noticed you just posted something on the side about, I have two more questions. You just posted something on the side about the cave dwellings. Did you have another question you'd like to, to offer? Well, it could be Xiao Wang or Da Wang, or could it be Lao Wang, right? I, I could be Lao Wang. Uh, um, oh, no, I don't want to uh, take up more time. It's just that I did um, um, some work with, a, by now, a prominent academic in the, out of uh, Xi'an, um, uh, in the Xi'an Jinzhou Kujidashia. He, um, he did, has done a lot of work in uh, the Yan'an area. And um, um, this is just a publication that he and I did uh, about the Yaodong. There are many, 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 many people living in the Yaodongs. And um, uh, these are, so he, he and his green team has uh, gone in there to design new Yaodong dwellings for these people. I, the, I think the thing that is germane for us is just that it raises um, insofar as architecture is symbol and representative of uh, something, 
you know, how, how much of a distance there is between um, these cave dwellings and, and their residents. Um, and by the way, there's a Mao Zedong museum that's in a cave dwelling. Um, yeah. um, that's where the journalism, that's where the journalism operation is. Oh, thank you. And, and so, um, the, you know, the, the whole point of the doing building rejuvenating this, these Yaldones as a local village mayor who himself live, lives in one, he says, we need to build these new Yaldones to call the young people back. So there, there's, there's symbolic power to, to these forms. And you know, my, my question just for conversational and, and learning purposes is when we, when we bring in something so prominent as a Gothic uh, Romanesque type of expression there for the church, how much it's connecting with local rural people in terms of what uh, Dr. Chow uh, said in terms of this, uh, the, the messaging of the gospel. Do you want to remark on that, Dr. Carboneau, or move the, to that? I, the question was exactly what I, I was trying to pick that up. Oh, sir, I, I'm not sure it was a, I, it was just a concern that um, I have when we talk about these things that the um, the distance in meaning be, uh, in, ter in terms of the power of architecture to symbolize between rural uh, cave dwellings, which is prized by the local people there, and the messaging of the gospel and the and the and the dress that the gospel comes in and just you know I'd love to have a conversation about um, this Gothic Romanesque looking church and what type of messaging that actually has to and just in terms of Paul's well, uh, well, Paul's I, I think, to be all things to all people. I do think I do think to answer your question. One of the great things I think about learning Chinese history, the more you get into this and you go province to province, place to place, especially in the rural areas, is uh, because the rural areas were under such um, uh, stress, I guess, between the Kuomintang, the, um, the, the, the communists, the, 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 China, the Japanese, local bandits, um, you know, this was these, these, these spaces of these caves um, were seen as, as places where families uh, and, and missionaries, everybody huddled together to, to survive bombings, to hide out from bandits. I mean, this is, this, is, this is life, this is life space. I mean, forget sacred space. This is human space that keeps you cool in the summer and you, you gotta figure out something to do in the winter. So this is where people actually survived and also where people died. In, in the caves in Chongqing, you know, 10,000 people were killed when a cave collapsed in the famous Japanese bombings there. So these, these spaces are, you know, um, are, are, I would say are, are just human uh, because they remind us of the fragility of life and the imposition of oppression and the hope of people who live there at times as well. So these are, these spaces are always, very, I always find them very moving to sort of see. And, and the fact that they haven't bulldozed these like they have the hutong is sort of interesting to me. I mean, maybe that's going to emerge as they expand in the rural areas, but um, I, I find it still an interesting new area. Thank you, sir. Um, two more questions. I think we have enough time. Um, this, this, they're actually somewhat related. So the first question, the second question will be directed toward both you and Professor Steinhardt. Um, this first question first begins with noting that there are, uh, there is a popular pub publishing agenda right now for the history of modern architecture in major Chinese cities. Uh, even myself, I just bought a book called Beijing Xiandai Jianzhu Shi. Uh, a history of modern architecture. And the book is filled with images of churches. So the question is then, um, and also the question mentions that in Beijing, they're establishing at the North Church, a museum dedicated to the architecture of that church. And they are hoping to repatriate historical photographs. So the question then is, um, can you reflect on the fact that you have access to an incredible archive with images of churches, images of places in China, and missionary archives are, are filled with images of churches? 
Can you reflect on well, how it's wet, worded this? Can you say something about the repatriation, even if digitally, of historical images of Christian architecture to China? Well, I, I would say that one of the things that struck me when I started doing the metadata for the, a lot of the photography that uh, Professor Joseph Ho used um, when he came to the Ricci Institute when it was in San Francisco, and again, it's moving to Boston College uh, it, it, by the end of the year. Um, one of the things that really struck me was something I had never thought about before, and, and Professor Ho hinted this uh, pretty strongly in his uh, talk, if not told us directly. You know, everyone thinks when these missionaries and, and thought about this China experience, and I've even said at times over the years in different public situations, you know, the China church, uh, I wrote an article in the uh, Canon Law Digest where I looked at 19... 60 to 1970, 1980, and pretty much during the Cultural Revolution, nothing was being published. Everyone thought the Catholic Church was dead in China. I mean, they really thought it was dead. There was nothing being published on this. And so my feeling when I look at these uh, images now is these missionaries uh, uh, or even the local Chinese Catholics, forget this is a Western narrative. This is a Chinese narrative. You know, this is, this is, a, this is a narrative of faith and social reimagining of how society changes. And that's why everybody should pay attention to it. And, and it really is about the humanity of people engaging with one another. So I think in some ways the photography makes it freer for us to actually communicate more. I think if we posture this as paradigms about you know, this relationship and that relationship, who's this side, who's that side, we miss the humanity of it. And I just was so awed by the fact that this is still alive. If I'm looking at this, Joseph Ho, Professor Joseph Ho is looking at this, someone online is looking at this, it's in a footnote of a book, it's still alive. And we might debate whether or not it's an active um, uh, civic religious norm, but I still think it, 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 it's, not, it's not going away. And I think governance, not just the communists, but any civil society has to look at religious space as part of a human experience. Right. I, I just want to also note that I, I just imagine a, a great number of screenshots that have been taken during this symposium of some of the marvelous images that have been shown. And I, I remember once giving a, a lecture uh, in, in China and the I would say at least half had cell phones uh, held up, taking photographs of my slides, which was quite, quite fun. Well, here's the last question then, and, and then we'll, we'll uh, adjourn until we gather tomorrow. Um, the last question is sort of thinking about thinking about the images that 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 Dr. Carbono you uh, showed of your trip to Yan'an, also including some very interesting historical images uh, of Hulong, for example, and Father uh, Shanahan with with Chairman Mao. There is this reality that these archives hold uh, images of spaces that don't exist now as they did before, uh, and it's related to the last question. But here's the real question then. Um, for Professor Steinhardt, uh, that is, these Christian archives have images of Christian churches. Many of them are gone, but you're working with buildings such as mosques uh, that may not be extant anymore. Uh, is there an equivalent in other religious traditions of preserved either drawings, engravings, or photographs that help scholars of other religious tradition religious traditions to uh, recapture an image of what architecture looked like in China? Well, it's, it's very hard to generalize about any one tradition or across traditions. Um, I think that I, I'm going to say tomorrow something I'm happy to say right now. I think um, in Professor Kuman's talk yesterday, he made a very strong point that architectural historians have to deal with actual material that survives. And this is probably a premise of mine too. Um, an ongoing discussion that I have with colleagues and close friends who are historians is that they use images to illustrate what they write, but I actually use images as primary sources. So, so if something doesn't survive, there, are, there always is at least one step removed from the original. And then the next, you know, I mean, this is a big question. So a few things I'll throw out. The next 
aspect to help answer this question is that there are different kinds of archives and different kinds of documents. Something that has come up in the talks today, and I'm not sure people are as conscious of it uh, as maybe I, I'm always conscious of this. One of the things I like about dealing with architecture from the 13th or 14th century onward is that Europeans saw the buildings. And sometimes someone will, a European will notice something that someone who's part of the culture takes for granted and doesn't notice. And so one of the values of the archives that we've heard about now, one of the values of um, the Christian archives that were used in uh, Dr. Charbonneau's talk that I was just processing as I was listening, is that this is someone kind of inside, but also outside watching a changing historical moment. And that's a, a really unique kind of archive. Mosques have different criteria from the beginning <laughs> because of the religious requirements necessary for someone to pray and because of the, the community who's praying. And I actually am going to talk about this tomorrow, but it's, I think it's hard to generalize uh, to answer the question that was asked, but maybe the, uh, whoever asked it can ask me again tomorrow because mosques are definitely going to come up. Excellent, thank you. Well, we have gone just a bit over. I not regretfully, happily have gone a bit over. Thank you to everyone, especially our respondents and our presenters today. Thank you for ending us, uh, uh, Dr. Carboneau and Dr. Chow. Uh, and we will convene tomorrow again for the keynote presentation with Dr. Steinhardt. What a joy um, this has been for me. I, I knew that Dr. Carboneau, you were going to end around 2019. So in my talk, I deliberately began uh, with a reference to the 13th century to, to, in fact, to sort of underscore the point that Dr. Steinhardt just meant that Europeans have been in China for, for quite a long time and have been uh, uh, offering observations. Uh, it's been a great joy to uh, hear about this topic from so many angles, but let me just end because we're over. So thank you everyone. Uh, enjoy the rest of the day or morning, how, whatever part of uh, the sun cycle you are in, and we'll see you again tomorrow for the rest of the symposium. Thank you. <laughs>